Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to a day in the life of a death doula with myself, Mandy Benwalid and Jill Schock. This is um, the video version of Talk Death's new series, A Day in the Life, where we interview professionals within the death care and end of life space to help demystify this work, to bridge the gap between death professionals and the general public, and of course, to encourage everyone to talk death. Talk Death has been producing videos like this since 2013, actually, way back when it was under the Keeper brand. And our videos back then were called hashtag talk death. And you can actually still find them on YouTube and on our website as well. And this video will be um, part of our new series that will kind of fit within that umbrella where we will be interviewing other death care professionals. And we're really thrilled to be doing this in partnership with EOL. And of course, a really big thank you to EOL um, for putting all of this together with us. And of course, for all the wonderful resources that they are providing to our community. So just to give us some quick intros, I'm Mandy, and uh, I'm joining you today from uh, Hamilton, Ontario. And I'm originally from Montreal. I'm the co-founder and the editor of Talk Death. Oh, there's a lovely photo of me. We all love that. Um, <laughs> so Talk Death's mission is to encourage positive and constructive conversations around death and dying and help people really make educated end of life decisions for themselves as well as for their loved ones. I'm also the founder and president of Keeper, which is a collaborative online memorial platform where friends and family can remember and celebrate those who are dearly missed with stories, tribute messages, photos, videos, milestones, and so much more. And we also offer virtual and hybrid memorial service events and facilitation. And of course, more importantly, we have Jill Shock with us today who is the owner of Death Doula LA. Jill is a full-time death doula serving around 75 families a year. She is a Los Angeles native with over a decade of experience in end of life care. She believes in empowering her clients to step away from the imposed traditions and negative stigma around death and embrace personal choice and style as the chapter of life comes to an end. Jill has received a master's degree in ethics and theology from Vanderbilt University Divinity School and was trained and certified as a clinical chaplain or spiritual counselor. She's been fe featured in Wired, Goop, Pure Wow, Mind, Body, and Soul, and a lot more. So as a full-time death doula, a death doula mentor, and the co-organizer of a deeper dive into death retreat, Jill is really an exceptional guide to those looking to embark on the death doula path. And we are so lucky to have her here today. Hi, Jill, how's it going? Hi, Mandy, thank you so much. I'm excited to see this lovely group and be here and share all the wisdom I can. Yeah, and I, we thanked you well, but obviously thank you all for, for being here and joining us today. Um, for those of you that may have friends who wanted to attend but couldn't, uh, this will be going up on the EOL site as well as on Talk Death site. So just keep in touch with the emails and make sure to be following all of us and you'll be able to rewatch any of this or send it over to anyone that you think can benefit from this talk. So the way that we are going to kind of work today is I'm going to be doing some, uh, well, I'm going to be asking some questions to Jill. And some of them are a little more basic. Some of them are, we're gonna kind of dive into some more meatier items, but please start thinking of any questions you have. And to do so, try to use the Q and A feature, which you should see on the bottom of your screen. If it's like small basic questions, we'll definitely kind of just send you over a message in chat. And if it's a question that's like really relevant to what we're talking about at that moment, we'll try to slip it in. But if not, what we'll do is we'll have a Q&A time at the end. We're gonna try to leave at least 15 minutes, but it will depend on how many questions you all start sending in. So if you have a bunch of questions, feel free to kind of enter them at any time and we will get to them um, 
as much as we can. And if not, we're all on social media and we'll make sure to you know, answer any other questions you have. So let's get started with the basics, Jill. Okay. What is a death doula for all of those who do not know what a death doula is? Yeah, so I'll break this down into a couple different parts because there's a basic definition of the word doula, um, which is the Greek word. Um, and it actually quite literally translates to a woman in service. Um, so that's kind of the starting point here. Um, there are obviously men, women, multi-gendered people in this space. So I don't know how much the women part actually applies, but a doula really is someone in service to another person, um, in our case, dying, who really needs help. Um, doulaing can take many forms. I don't think there's one way to doula. I think everybody has their style and also you have your own relationship with your client. So there's a lot of things that go back and forth that go into what the act of doulaing actually is for your specific client. Um, I'd also say that we can expand the word doula into the section of death work in general. You absolutely do not have to be a doula to help the dying or do any kind of death work. Some people identify with doula ship, other people don't. Um, my, the way that I explain to my clients how I doula is that I'm a guide, I'm supportive. Um, I can educate and help navigate you give you options and help you advocate for those. So that's my definition of a doula. Yeah, I think that's a great definition because it really is, it's really quite expansive, but it also, you also have a very specific role within the family and within a dying person's end of life space. So that's, that's really great to know. Um, but I think it's also important for everyone to understand where you're coming from and how you got to where you are today. So, you know, why did you become a death duel? You know, there's the whole, what's your why? What really yeah. drove you down that path? Yeah, and I'd love for our participants today to really keep this question in mind and maybe even write it down somewhere so you can reflect back on what your why is trying to get into this field. So I originally went to college um, to do history, more specifically public history. I used to work in museums doing archi archives and research and collections. So I did not set out on this path to begin with, but right at the end of my college career, I experienced a really messy death situation for the first time. And I think a lot of us in this room have that in common where we saw where the holes were, what could have been done better, the things we wish we knew um, so it could have done smoother. So that is what really sparked me to go back to school and get involved in chaplaincy which um, clinical chaplains, you know, they're the ones in the hospitals that do all the spiritual counseling and handle um, emergency triage, triage, et cetera. But um, how I really got to being a doula is after working in the medical field from 2009 to 2005, well, I worked up until 2017, but 2015 uh, full-time, it was really hard for me as a chaplain to keep my job um, because a lot of times in healthcare when there's budget cuts or anything like that they'll just cut your hours um, especially if they're using you as a per diem employee so a it's hard to secure full-time jobs as a clinical chaplain um, there's like a lot of faults in the way that the medical industry gets paid and so actually this uh, chaplaincy is like really low on the totem pole um, so working for hospice and working for healthcare systems wasn't a good fit for me. Um, it actually ended up being safer for me to become an entrepreneur and start my own business because then no one could fire me and I was in control of setting my own prices, things like that. So I made the full-time switch, um, and I worked, let's see, part-time in hospice from like 2016 to 17, and then in 17, I made the full-time switch into Death Doula LA and I've been full-time ever since. Amazing. And so what about, you know, I know that 
part of your work was also that you didn't agree with a lot of the things happening within the funeral industry and you wanted to sort of change that a little. Um, were there certain things in particular that, you know, once again, working within healthcare drove you to doing that as well? Well, yeah, so chaplains do a lot of the funeral arrangements. Mm -hmm. And so uh, making a lot of calls to different local mortuaries and funeral homes, I'm just noticing this pattern of sales essentially and how it works. Um, and what I have learned from my colleagues, um, you know, over time is like the actual laws and the actual rules um, really have, we have so many choices. We don't have to go along with the prescribed script, if you will, that we get from uh, normative funeral home services. So I've been a really big advocate for, you know, DIY funeraling, uh, if you will, and uh, just letting people know they have choices. And that's also a really big selling point for me as a doula is I know how to save a family a lot of money just by uh, giving them a different kind of funeral experience. Right. Amazing. Yeah. And of course, more options to be able to even have an at-home funeral and an, or an right. at-home wake. Exactly. Amazing. Um, and our next question is actually uh, some of the questions that are coming in. I'm just taking a look over here. Okay. This is the uh, whole crux of this talk. Run us through a typical day as a death doula. I feel like a day is kind of hard to like fully gauged what you actually do. So let's kind of talk about it in the context of a week as a death doula. That's a, yeah, that's probably a better way to break it down. Um, so over time as a business owner, I've had to really uh, hone in on routine block scheduling, um, things like that to keep myself organized because I have one, two, three, like four or five aspects that go into making income with my business. So uh, the first client of that is, I mean, the first aspect is obviously clients. So that, that'll take up about 50% of my time, depending on how many clients I have. I like to keep a census of anywhere from six to 12, and that will fluctuate. This year in particular, post-COVID, I started the year off with 16 patients in um, January. A month, so right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and they rotate in and out. Um, so that's, I keep an eye on my census. I, I do, you know, check-ins, weekly check-ins. I do drive-bys with supplies and just to say hi, you know, things like that. Um, then I have my mentorships. So I started a mentorship program about a year and a half ago, um, just for people who want to take their training deeper one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, be really involved with an entrepreneur like startup community, kind of like an incubator. Um, so I've been working on that with my mentorships and my intentional community. So that takes up, you know, uh, another piece of the pie chart. Um, and then I do, uh, let's see. Uh, and I meet with my mentees every week and we also do a community group every week. Um, and then I have projects, events, and collaborations. So I'm constantly working on other things with colleagues, um, you know, workshops and events that we could do also in the community, community education. Um, and then I, uh, pretty much set all this up on Sunday. I check in with my admin and I set up my, um, whole week of list of tasks, things to do. Uh, and I do work weekends and on calls sometimes. Wow, that's like a pretty big plate um, to busy. have. So that's, so what, what, what I like about what you're doing is you're not only, you know, you're not only a doula, but you're an active member of the community and um, you're also trying to help other doulas. And so I think that's really great. And that kind of can show a lot of us the spectrum and it shows a lot of us that you don't just have to be, you know, working with clients full time. Although that is your main focus, you can still run a business or offer these services and still be involved and have time to do other things. Yeah. Um, but on that note, I think it would also be helpful for everyone. You know, out of that entire pie we just talked about, can we kind of dive in a little bit more onto the sliver of of the client side? So maybe run us through almost like the life cycle. Um, no pun intended, I guess, but uh, to, like quite literally the life cycle of your families, like 
how does it start? Is it like a phone call and then a consultation? And like, what are you doing with families in particular every week? So my family, so I have my web, website set up for clients. I have a client portal where you can go in and fill out an intake form, which then schedules our free consultation. I give 45 minutes for those consultations. We might not use it, but a lot of times families have a lot to talk about. So I use that 45 minutes to really discern what their needs are and then what services specifically I can offer them and show them my packages, my prices, or if they wanna work on a la carte or hourly rates, or if they don't wanna work with me at all, that's fine. So we do the consultation, they decide whether or not they wanna move forward. And then we set, um, dates up to follow up with the services that they need. Now, a lot of times how long I'm with a client will range depending on what kind of illness they actually have. So for example, if someone has stage four pancreatic cancer, I know that I probably only have about a month, if that, to get everything done and together. Someone with Alzheimer's dementia might be a client that I have for years, right? Um, I also do medical aid and dying with clients, which is legal in this state under the End of Life Options Act in California. Um, so sometimes I just have people who hire me to show up the day of and help them uh, be present and walk them through the medical aid and dying process. So it really depends. Like I can meet a client and die with them in one day, or I could be with them for years. So that's why the consultation and having an organized intake form for starting up doulas is really important. So you get all those pieces and you have a record of who's spoken to you and your notes and all that. So it's good for files as well. So that's how it all starts with the clients. Okay. And how often, I mean, even especially with COVID out of curiosity, how often are you meeting with families or with your patients? Like that in also, a week or in a month even? That also depends on, again, the need. Some families want like one information session, session jam one and done, and then they take it and go forward. Some, pa some patients I'm dropping by multiple times a week because they're actively dying. Um, so it really just depends on where they're at with the need, which is why I have to set most of my time aside for clients because I have to be flexible because you never really know uh, what's gonna happen. And so. you live in LA and driving there is a nightmare. I don't know how you drive around to see multiple clients a week. That's wild. Well, the good news is our community out here is really growing. And so like, I don't have to drive down to Orange County or up to Ventura County or out to the high desert anymore because there's doulas here now. So I can just call and refer. Amazing. Okay. Is that yeah. something that you do often? Uh, yeah, more and more often because the need for doulas is really picking up. Like I said, I noticed a huge uptake at the beginning of this year. I've been mm -hmm. noticing an uptake thanks to, you know, all the media, our colleagues have been doing, you know, doulas are becoming more normative. So the market is not as difficult as it used to be. So yeah, I'm referring more and more. Okay, amazing. And this kind of ties into one of the questions we were going to talk about and, and it came up and I feel like it's a good moment to maybe ask you about it. Um, we don't have to talk specifics, but in general, like how are your, what's your pricing structure like? Cause you kind of said that you have a la carte or services, maybe talk us through like one of your package services. I think hourly, we all have a sense of, of what you do there, but maybe talk to us about like your packages and, and how they differ. I'm gonna break it down for you right off of my website. But the way that I put these together, so while I was in that in-between space working part-time for hospice and transitioning into full-time doula, um, I worked for quote unquote donations only. I've never worked for free. I work for donations and I will work pro bono for good, but I really am very cautious about using the narrative or script of free work. Um, I have a set, a set amount of pro bono hours that I choose to use or not. Um, so heads up. Okay, so my packages, I have a little chart here on my website that I'm literally reading off of, um, but my hourly rate, uh, I don't leave my house for less than $200. So that includes travel time, gas, uh, the visit itself and getting home as well. So that's kind of my press go to go to somebody's house and do a sit down session. 
But um, so I have three packages here and my prices range pretty much anywhere from $50 to $1,500. So it's pretty accessible. Um, uh, so like my basic package is the consultation, the in-home care plan visits with calls, emails, and texts included. You'll definitely wanna set up some boundaries around how much communication because you will always have a family that will text you like a hundred times a day inappropriately. So draw some boundaries. And you have a you have a personal and a work cell for that reason, right? That's right. I have yes. two phones with different ringers on them so I can do some healthy compartmentalization. Uh, so I have a basic, a basic plus and a full package. My basic is 750, basic plus is a thousand and full is 1500. And then I have a la carte services ranging from $50 to $500. And I have a ClickBook Pay set up on my website. So my clients, if they, okay, I want this package, can just click book and pay. And then everything that the package includes are uh, listed on the side. That's much more accessible than I was thinking. I'm surprised that like not every family is doing this. I mean, a funeral director's service fees are more than that for sure. Exactly. Yeah. And that's like kind of the offset, you know, disrupting the funeral industry. Um, I don't have personal problems. I just think that people should have choices on how they want to spend their money and the experience that they have. So this is, this is kind of going off on a tangent, but I feel like it's just relevant when we bring this up. And this is something that I've been thinking about for a few years, because it's come up a lot at some funeral conferences that I've been to. So with Keeper, we do provide our products and services to funeral homes and to cemeteries. And so I have to attend a lot of professional conferences. And something that I found was really interesting, actually, it was almost hilarious. Um, Cole was at the Cole and Perry was at that show with me and we both laughed about it. Um, I oh, I'm okay that I said that. Today. And uh, resting oh. Bandana. <laughs> Woo, represent. Yes. Um, but there was a talk that someone gave and it literally was like, the slide was like, doulas are trying to take funeral directors jobs. And it was horrible, obviously, but something that we don't have to get into it. We can talk about it a little bit. I think that there's so much synergy between, and gosh, I go to conferences, I use the word synergy, sorry. There's, there is synergy between funeral directors and death doulas in the sense that funeral directors, you know, they can do all that paperwork there's, they're amazing at arranging services. They have their benefits, but what a death doula does really walking the family through the process and holding their hand, that's not what a funeral director is paid for. Sometimes funeral directors have to do that type of work. Yes, they do get some grief training, but having that process of a death doula kind of starting off with the family, guiding them through the dying process, and then kind of, okay, your loved one has passed away. Here's your death certificate and let's help you with, you know, your cremation or your burial or whatever it may be. I think that there is so much opportunity for doulas and funeral directors to work together. Oh yeah. I, I cannot do most of the higher level, like trickier stuff, like Irish wakes and all that kind of stuff without funeral directors. Mm -hmm. We need funeral directors um, for a lot of different reasons, but to get the death certificates processed, to make transport easier, to help us with the final disposition, meaning where you're gonna end up. So I work hand in hand with funeral directors. And I also noticed a lot of funeral director doula hybrids, which I think is amazing. Um, and so you can see a lot of overlap and it's the same with clinicians too. Like a lot of hospice workers or, you know, nurses will step into this space as well. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of overlap in what we do, but I think the point is we doulas really just want to make, uh, clinicians and funeral directors life easy because we want to walk the client through quite easily. So if I can have their paperwork with all the you know, T's crossed and the I's dotted, a funeral director would be really appreciative of that. Or if, you know, hospice is having a hard time communicating with a family for whatever reason, I can help facilitate the communication, smooth things out. So I'm happy to make everybody's life easier. Clinicians, funeral homes, funeral directors, and my clients. That's my goal. Amazing. So we just talked a little bit more about what you are doing as a death doula, but I'm Curious about some of the biggest misconceptions around being a death doula. What is a death doula not? 
And maybe let's start on the client side. Are there certain things when you maybe show up to your first meeting or you have your first phone consultation that people expect or think you do something that doulas typically don't or should not be doing? Yeah, you want to set expectations right away. I mean, I don't want to give people a list of like do's and don'ts, you know, but typically doulas and, you know, you shouldn't be signing up to do like housework um, or like child care. You're not the funeral director, so you can't sign those papers. You're not a clinician um, and you're actually not a licensed professional where there's pros and cons for that. So you just want to make it clear that your job is to, you know, be working for this family in the background and being supportive and being a guide, um, but not necessarily um, doing everything that goes around a death. I see a lot of doulas get caught up in maybe a caretaker role. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to You don't want to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Where you end up like spending hours like cleaning their house and stuff. And that's, right. You want to yeah. hire people to do that. I've been using care.com as a resource lately, and it's actually been pretty effective, but, um, there's plenty of care agencies where you can get help. So, um, definitely hire out caregivers and house cleaners and child sitters. And yeah, so, so you're referencing this too. So you can almost create yeah. like your own network of like other Oh yeah. Professionals or folks that you can work with be like, I don't do that, but here's someone that will. And it's like, they're going to do a better job at it. You know, like, don't ask me to like, take care of a two-year-old. Like I wouldn't know what to do. Right. But right. I can yeah. help you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, also a new one of, well, not new, but a lot of people need professional organizers. I know there's some doulas that do Swedish death cleaning services. Um, I don't do that. Cause like I, need to Swedish death clean my own house. But um, <laughs> there are professional organizers and like as people who can handle the physical stuff and the estates. Um, I like to keep good references with estate attorneys so we can work hand in hand together. So yeah, collab, collab, collab. Amazing. And so let's talk about, you know, you've mentored many doulas before. You've been very active in this space. You hear a lot of these conversations going on. And this is actually interesting. Some of the questions are coming in through this that are related to what I think you're going to say about it, which is, you know, what are some of the biggest misconceptions you hear for other folks looking to become a death doula? What do people, what are people expecting that we might have to give the harsh reality to? Yeah. Um, you're not the center of attention, you know, when you're walking in. I think, I think a lot of work that doulas have to do with themselves personally is ego-based work. You know, why am I really here? Someone needs help. So I'm a modality to help get them what they need um, for comfort care and stuff like that. So um, it's not about me. I'm not the center of attention. I'm not coming in there to be like, doulas here time to zhuzh it all up, you know, that's not gonna happen. Um, I try to stay just organized, quiet, invisible, and just do my job without getting too much personally involved. Um, I don't see doulas as like figures of authority. I really see them needing to be eye to eye on the level with um, the clients and their loved ones. So not telling people what to do, but more so just giving them all the options and then supporting and advocating for them. Um, let me turn my page here. Um, a lot of people think that doulas are present at the time of death. Um, not necessarily true. Also, again, it's not about you. The family might not even want you there. If any of you have experienced personal loss, you know how intimate that circle is around the bed. And typically I'm not in that circle as a doula, nor do I think I should be. If the family asks and wants me to be there, I will be. But normally I keep track when people are in their final 48 hours, I'll do flybys for support, check in, be in contact with hospice and set the family up to stay present with the person who's dying. And then I'll typically get the call like after they die. Um, but it's more rare that they'll ask me to be there. So that's a big misconception that we like have to be there. Never insert yourself into someone's intimate space. Um, and actually, well, on that note, because one of the questions that we received was, do you sit vigil? Uh, 
no, the family sits vigil. I help them understand that vigil is a thing and offer creative aspects and tools for vigil, but um, it's not worth for them to pay me to just sit around their house. Now it's a different story with a solo ager. If that's a client and they're alone, I might be sitting with them in their final hours. But most of the time we have loved ones for support to do that. Great. Awesome. Is there anything else on, um, yes. The misconceptions. All right. Let's, let's finish those up. Probably the last and final biggest one, I think, is that you can't make a full-time living being a death doula or a death care professional. Um, I want us to stop saying this, stop this script. The more you say it in your head, the more true it becomes. We need to encourage our community to be professional. Um, what we do has immense value. And so we need to be prepared to take on these entrepreneurship efforts and go through a small business startup and get paid for the work that we do and be with community. Um, and so this is a real profession. This is not like a hobby, it can be, but you can make a full-time living doing this. It just takes a lot of work on the business end, which is hard for me as well. <laughs> so, but it can be done, I promise. And that leads great to the next question, which I'm sure many of you are asking. And I think some of the folks here, based on the questions I'm seeing, are, are very beginner and um, are just starting to explore um, the possibility of becoming a death doula. Um, so really, how does one become a death doula? Well, you know, look at your why picture again. Some of you are coming from professional spaces that have already trained you in some skills that you might need for this work. Um, there are many people who come out of event planning, funeral directing, clinical work, um, financial planning, uh, all kinds of grief backgrounds, all kinds of stuff. It doesn't really matter where you come from, but having your big why. Um, you have a lot of choices out there about education, training, and potentially certification. So just do your research and see which program fits you and your goals and your needs. Um, I would definitely encourage people to do their research on learning how to do a small business startup. You know, because if you're going to work for yourself, you're going to be happy. Like you can design your business however you want it to be, but you should have that goal, that seed planted before you start your education so you can continue to level up and level up. So choose your educational program if you think you need it. Um, and you can go from there. But the reality is that it's you, there's no governing body for being a doula. It's not like being That's correct. Um, like a hospice worker or like a social worker. Um, that is or a correct. chaplain. That's correct. Yeah. So it's really something that folks can choose to do to introduce themselves to the field and to learn a bit more. And, you know, just like your mentorship program, and I know other doulas are offering similar programs, which is great to, you know, be able to have that one-on-one -on -one time. But at the end of yeah. the day, the, the certifications and the education is really for you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's, it's what you need to feel confident to get the skills to start and start working. I'm a, I've always been, cause I was trained in the medical model of see one, do one, teach one. So I, with my mentees, I kind of do that and like push them out of the nest pretty quickly because I want them to start getting clients and practicing. Um, and you and I talked about this, but you should also ask yourself when you like ask the why of, do I want to become a death doula? Do I want to run my own business or do I want to do this kind of like part time? All of that's acceptable, but you should figure that out before you start. Um, make plans and goals, use business resources. I know different cities have free business mentorship programs, maybe invest in a business coach, get someone to help you with your financial planning so you can set up your health insurance and your retirement plan. So there's a lot uh, to be done, but also you can just do it part-time or if you just want to help, you can volunteer for hospice. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point. Um, I personally took one business class in university to make my parents happy to say, I'll you know, try doing business. And 
I still remember the first day of that business course, the, the professor asked who in this room would like to become an entrepreneur and run their own business. And I think every single person in the room raised their hand, but me. And I was like, absolutely not. I saw just growing up seeing, um, my, my father was, has been an entrepreneur and has run his own business for a long time never has time for anything. And here I am now running two businesses and I had no idea I would be doing that and I'm making it work, but I would say try it, but definitely don't underplay the business part because if you do want to become a full-time death doula, it's your income, right? And I know that it's like an unpopular opinion. I think that people talking about being a death doula is, is part of, is a business. And a lot of people, I don't think anyone really talks about it that much. Um, And I'm glad that you're bringing this to light because we all need to realize that it is something you can make a living off of, but you just have to plan um, just like any other business would. That's right. And that's how I've been successful is that I have invested time and money into learning business and money. Um, So yeah, I knew I had all the skills, you know, to do the work, but I had to figure out how to make money. So yeah, you really got to invest time in that. Amazing. And um, gosh, I can't believe the time already. It's going by so I fast. I know. Should we start just like, to, I don't know what we should do, take questions or? Well, so there's actually one question that people have been asking that I wanted to ask you because I think it's really important, which is, you know, obviously you have to train, you have to get your business up and running, but how do you actually start getting clients? How do you make your services known? Uh, Well, you need to start making relationships with hospices and funeral homes because they're your right and left hand. You want to link arms. So you want them to know that you're around. Um, A lot of people start out kind of working with their friends and family to just kind of get a flavor of it. Um, I get referrals from clinicians because I've worked in this area for so long. So all the nurses and stuff that I used to work with know me and they know what I do and they'll call me. Um, Palliative care doctors, I've already said hospice teams, religious leaders, colleagues, if you have a specialty like Alzheimer's, medical aid and dying, cancer, that might help, Um, word of mouth. I also use SEO and I have a very, uh, I, I had a creative director brand me. So I have a brand and, um, you know, I use search engine optimization words to try and imagine what people are Googling at two in the morning who might be trying to find my services. Um, I offer free educational seminars to my local community so they can come and meet me and um, remember me. Most of the time I will get a few bites from doing those. And I make, I have already said this, but I just make as many friends as possible. Um, particularly with funeral directors and hospice. Okay, amazing. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, like, let's start jumping into the questions. And one that I think follows really well, and I'm sure many people are wondering this, especially because you have experience working in hospice. Um, How would you differentiate between what a death doula does and the services that are offered by hospice, including social workers, volunteers? And, And thank you to all of those of you, by the way, that are asking these questions. They're amazing. I'm like trying to go through them as fast as possible. Yeah, this is awesome. So hospice, if you want to imagine it, it's there's a circle of care, right? So you have your medical director, your attending physician, your RN case manager, your LVN auxiliary nurse. You have someone who's doing bathing aid. And then you have psychosocial spiritual. So you have access to a social worker and a chaplain and volunteer services. So that's the whole circle of care um, with hospice and how that works is the patient um, gets paid. The patient is worth X amount of money per day, depending on their condition and that money comes from Medicare. So everyone who sees that patient in the hospice circle of care gets paid through their bank. I think the biggest difference is that doulas are an auxiliary of that care and they work directly for the patient. They get paid by the patient. And so that's a direct advocacy relationship that you wanna build. Um, And we we can show up more than hospice because hospice, they have regulations on how many visits they can do because again, they're working with Medicare's bank. And so billing and their time is actually very limited 
Um, so even though they do amazing work, it's great to have someone on the outside to be helping um, and just be communicating and um, always like being more involved with the client. Great. Um, and this one is a question by someone. What about directly giving care to a patient during their dying process? Are you spending time reassuring and explaining the process? I guess maybe the question could be to the family and to the client um, of what is happening. And just quick pause on that. Someone asked, what's it like, do you consider the client, the family, or so just to be clear, the client is the dying individual and the family is their community, their family and friends that are. Yes. So I try to use that language very particularly. The client is the dying person and the loved ones are the surrounding circles. So when someone is in their active dying process, because there's two parts to dying, there's conscious and unconscious dying. So when they're in their unconscious space is really when the loved one needs more uh, support and just knowledge. And so I work with hospice to do the education, but I also keep these resource materials. Sorry, they're right next to my desk. I'm gonna. You so just like, I, use... I like looked down for a second. I was like, oh, where did she go? <laughs> So these, I use these, these are resources from a lady named Barbara Carnes. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of her. Um, but these little booklets are so great to just stick in the family's hand, especially if they're sitting at the bedside waiting for someone to die. Um, they have little outlines in back where you can see like, okay, what's my loved one going through? One to three months, weeks or days. So they have this, and this is written by an RN. So this is clinically sound information. So this blue one's the basic one that I use. I also have one called the 11th hour, which is really about um, sitting at the bedside and watching through the final 48, which can be very intense, especially you know with changes happening in the body, breath is moving, agitation is happening, temperature is fluctuating. So there's also a lot of medication that goes into that. So Barbara Kearns also has a book about medications, pain medication at end of life, um, but hospice will also be able to walk you through why they're using certain medications and what they're treating, et cetera. So providing educations, doing flybys, being supportive is basically what I do while someone's actively dying. And so of you, like you being actually at the bedside or like sitting with the dying person and the family, it, it's kind of like you mentioned before, it can really depend on the family and their needs. Just like when we plan fun funerals for families, um, some families really need their hand held and they need to be walked through it all. And other families just kind of show up and be like, here's the funeral I want, or like, we know what we're doing now that you gave us the tools, right? Exactly. exactly. And I think that that's something that's really important for all of us um, wanting to work in this space to acknowledge and to realize that, yes, we are providing services, we as in, you know, death care providers and in particular death doulas, but I think it's really important for us to be sharing this knowledge. And I think this is where some of the um, debate around certification comes in, which we don't have to get into at this time, but it's really important to be educating families. Yeah. And they should, because then they can pass that knowledge on to their next family member and they'll know what to do the next time. And it'll help destigmatize death. Because if yes. you're just there doing it for the family, they are not going to learn. And their experience, like they might have a good experience because you're so good at what you do. But the more, and I think a lot of you know this, but the more hands on you are with the dying, the the easier it is to grieve them and just the better, more fulfilling experience it will be for the family. So there are yes. reasons why you're not sitting visual and you're not being, you're not with the family 24 seven. Cause it's not about you when your loved one's dying, you can sit at their bedside. Um, so, you know, that's the ego thing you got to get over, but you said it really perfectly. I think, um, that was a great way to lay it out. Great. Well, yeah, I'm glad that we're all kind of getting on the same page with that. I think it's super important. Mm -hmm. um, and so a, a question that we have for Marjorie, um, do you continue your services after the death of the client? It's a great question, Marjorie, thank you. Um, so there are doulas who do grief work. I, I think a lot of you are noticing that we are evolving a lot in the, in the modern grief field and that there are, um, new modalities and a lot of resources for grief. So I'm not a grief counselor or a grief coach. I also 
have my own grief that I'm dealing with. So I don't do grief work with my clients. So I will refer out to someone who specializes in grief. What I will do is I will in the following weeks when I know that the loved one who's lost someone has a grief fog brain, you know, I'll like come by with some goodies and just check in on them, maybe some books or some food or something like that. And just do a general check-in and I'll text them just to say hi. But for anything for like actual grief support, I refer to other people. Okay, great. Um, okay. So many questions. Um, I'm just trying to think of which one next to do. Um, actually kind of on that note, are you doing any kind of estate planning resources? Are you doing like any online sending people to online platforms or are you just referring them to like, um, estate lawyers, for example? Yeah. So it's interesting because a lot of my clients have actually thought about their financial planning more than they've thought, thought about their um, healthcare planning. So many of my clients come in with their own uh, estate planning. Um, and then also I have a local referral that I enjoy. Um, I haven't gotten into using much of the tech yet. Um, and my clients are also mostly baby boomers. So they're not super interested in using the tech either at this time. Um, so I pretty much just rely on traditional state attorneys to handle that. But I do tell my clients that state attorneys don't necessarily specialize in healthcare decisions. So they'll lump the healthcare power of attorney and advanced directive in with your financial power of attorney and uh, trust in a state. So people have a hard time mentally separating that. So I make sure to go back and not redo the advanced health care directive, but at least look at it um, and make sure we have copies and that they're not just sitting in the legal office. And actually that a question just came through and I think it's really uh, a good one to, to talk about is, do you help with the advanced planning? Are you doing oh, advanced yeah. care directives? Okay. Oh, well, so every day. <laughs> I guess what is like the... So you can do like, even if someone's like actively dying, like they could be dying next week or tomorrow. Is that one of like the first things that you try to do with a family to make sure that they have that? So it depends because some people come on with it already done. Some people contact me when they're already on hospice care and it's just like the final weeks and they want to talk about vigil and funeral support, stuff like that. Um, so it depends when they come on but I do offer an entire pre-planning package for people who don't have anything like that set up and we're going through it all for the first time. And I actually really like doing this lately with couples because I think it's really important, especially if they're, they have a family um, or even if the couple chooses not to have children, it's even more important. Um, so yes, that's a whole service. It's listed on my website. Okay, great. Um, I thought this was a, a good question because it's, we talked a lot about, you know, how there's a business aspect and, you know, when, when you kind of talked about what you do in a week, there were a lot of things. And um, someone wants to know if you have any tips on how to choose what to focus on in your business, considering that there's so many offerings and services that a death doula can provide. So, yeah, so that's why you really want to utilize a block schedule so that you know when you're focusing on certain aspects of your business. If you're just starting out, you might want to block out some of your schedule to do some marketing, you know, and if you are starting out, you know, advertising tools like Facebook or SEO might be helpful for you to drive traffic to your site. Um, let's see. What's the other part of that question? Can you say it one more time? Um, I just closed it, but the other part of the question is, oh yeah, how do you like, how do you decide like what to focus on within yeah, your so business? I just follow my block schedule and then obviously clients trump everything. So if a client calls me and this happens every single week, I'll have a, a disrupt in my schedule, but that's why the blocks are so nice because then you just drop the block, right? Um, and reschedule it. So I'm a big believer in that organized block schedule. Yeah, that's great. And I feel, um, I feel like it's something just as a business owner and even with the online memorial services that we're now offering, 
you're going to real, like things are going to change as you go and you're going to learn as you go. So there may, because it really depends on families, right? Every, because you're working with families, everybody is different. And so some families may have some needs, whereas, you know, others will have different needs and that's where you'll start to pick up on, okay, I enjoy doing this. I'm good at this. This is where I get the best feedback from. And so I think it's important before you say, okay, I'm going to focus on, on this type of work. Um, I think it's important for you to do all types of work and then you narrow it down afterwards. And I feel like that could be said with most parts of, of the business. Yeah. You get into it and then you figure out what you're drawn to. And then you kind of, you know, forge your specialty over time, you know, um, for a long, I mean, medically aided dying has only been legal since 2015. So I've only been able to do that skill since 2015. So you learn new things all the time. Um, and new things are happening in the funeral industry. I mean, billing changes all the time with healthcare. So there's always new stuff to learn and, 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 you know, kind of aim towards your specialty. Yeah. And I mean, with made, for example, you're one of the, like, I, some doulas won't even do medical aid and dying. And so you've kind of become a bit of a specialist in it because you have so much knowledge in it and you've done it so many times. Right. Yeah. So folks will know to refer you when, you know, they have medical aid and dying. Um, and someone actually on that note saying, how do you get certified in medical aid and dying? I don't believe there's a certification for it, but you can take some courses, right? Uh, it depends. There's certain organizations that you can volunteer with to learn how to do the patient bedside work. Um, but also there's compassion and choices. If you want to get involved, they're a wonderful organization that's been very much working very hard to get this legalized in all 50 states. I think we're at 11 states, New Mexico being the latest one, which was in, uh, I think, March of this year. So we're cooking. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, just you need to learn from these um, nonprofit companies. And actually the the last talk that um, we did is actually together, Jill. Um, We did uh, a two-part talk on medical aid and dying and it was amazing. So just go to YouTube and um, go to Talk Death's channel and uh, please look at that one if you're interested in this. Um, We did two part, one part was just kind of generalizing, talking about it. That was done with Compassion and Choices, best or nonprofit that's doing that kind of work right now, amazing advocacy. And then the second part was with um, Brittany Maynard's uh, partner. And Brittany Maynard is kind of one of the people that um, brought it to the forefront. She was on the cover of People Magazine because she was very young when she decided to choose medical aid and dying. So if you're interested in that, definitely uh, go check out those videos. Um, so we have time for one more question. Um, and I think this one is important, but what is the hardest part of your job of being a death doula? Hmm. I, I love my job and I'm also really happy um, with being able to run my own business, make my own schedule. Um, so when things get hard, I have time to make space to take care of myself, which I did not when I worked formally in healthcare. Um, So I think over the years, one of the hardest parts was learning about my own personal um, self-care system and blocking that out. And I try to compartmentalize my work, like this is work, this is personal life. and so that's been a really good tool for me. So I think lately, and this is just in particular, there's been a lot of young cancer because no one went to the doctor last year. And oh, so no. all those freckles, that colonoscopy or pap smear or just physical you didn't get, like for a lot of people turned into something worse. And um, for me personally, lately, that's been a lot to like let go of because the people who are dying are my age. So working on my death anxiety, but you know, also it's one of the benefits of having your own business is that you can actually properly take care of yourself. So I guess Amazing, that was yeah. like hard to learn that. And then it's just been hard processing a lot of these young deaths. Yeah, for sure. I can imagine you just like made my heart drop when you said that people our age are dying of cancer right now. That's horrifying. Yes. Wow. Um, well, 
That concludes our talk. Um, we actually have a quick, so uh, we have added some links in the chat. Uh, keep in touch with us at Keeper, at Death Doula LA, at Talk Death. Um, our plan is to do more of these day in the life video uh, events, interviews with EOL. Um, if you're curious what can come next, go to talkdeath.com, go into our search bar and look up day in the life. You'll see we've done Gosh, I don't know, I think maybe seven interviews so far um, yeah. with funeral directors and uh, cemetery owners and just really interesting things that you have many different paths that you can follow. Um, so we can share it. Jessica, oh no, that's just on my screen. Yeah, so th those are our handles, um, but as mentioned, it's also in the chat. Keep in touch. We will be announcing some more talks soon. Um, Jill. Thank you for your time. This has been so insightful. Uh, I can't believe we got that much content and that, that, that big of a conversation done in one hour. We did. <laughs> we did it. Um, and thank you again to EOL for hosting us today. And thank you to all of you for taking time out of your day to be with us. Yeah, Have a great you. rest of your day, everyone. Bye. <laughs>